Joe, there's one thing that you mentioned that uh, that I'm sure was a setup of something that you wanted to talk about now, but it was the blood pressure you gave. It was, I believe, it was 102 on on 88, and that blood pressure, you said, seems normal, but there's a problem, and that problem, at least one of the problems with that, uh, is the pulse pressure, and I, I think that's a really important part of uh, of shock to consider, as well as something that happens in other uh, intrathoracic conditions and other things. We have alterations in the pulse pressure. You know, it's interesting, Dan, because, you know, here again, if you don't understand this, if, if you just look at normals of blood pressure and you memorize these ranges for your test and you think that that's actually what's normal, you're going to find that normal is takes on a lot of different meanings. And I know one thing we always preach is normal has to be normal for that patient too. What's normal for one patient doesn't mean it's normal for another. Although we would all agree that that blood pressure clearly falls within the ranges that we would consider normal. I think we both would agree it's not normal. And and that's where you mentioned the pulse pressure. If you understand these components to blood pressure, it's easy to understand pulse pressure. And what pulse pressure basically is, is if you take the systolic blood pressure and you subtract off the diastolic blood pressure, that is your pulse pressure. So if your systolic blood pressure is 120 and your diastolic blood pressure is 80, 120 minus 80 is 40. Your pulse pressure is 40. Now, in general terms, normal pulse pressure is around 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. There's an equation to figure it out and so forth, but let's just say it's around 30 to 40. If you have a pulse pressure that actually is less than 30 to 40, it's considered narrow. If you have a pulse pressure that's more than that, it's considered wide. Let's talk about why you would have a narrow pulse pressure. If you remember early on, I'd said that the systolic blood pressure was actually a fairly good measure of the blood being ejected from the left ventricle. So that means if the blood being ejected from the left ventricle was reduced because you have a patient who's bleeding, you would expect the cardiac output to go down because that is the volume of blood being ejected from the left ventricle per minute is your cardiac output. So if the cardiac output is going down because you have less blood volume to eject out, you would expect the systolic blood pressure to go down. Well, remember what blood pressure has two components, cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Well, we already said that if your cardiac output's going down, your blood pressure is going to go down. Well, if the blood pressure is going down, the body wants to make up for that pressure. Remember, it wants to fix the pressure. It wants to increase the pressure. Well, if cardiac output's already going down, how do you fix the pressure? Well, the other component is systemic vascular resistance. How do we raise the resistance to raise the pressure? Make vessels constrict. Well, when you constrict vessels, what happens to the pressure inside those vessels? It goes up. So all of a sudden now, the systolic blood pressure, which is a good measure of the cardiac output, which is going down because you're losing blood and you're not ejecting as much blood out of the left ventricle, it's going down, whereas the diastolic blood pressure, which is a measure of the systemic vascular resistance, it's going up. All of a sudden, if you take the systolic blood pressure that's going down and the diastolic blood pressure that's going up, those two numbers start closing in on each other. The difference between them starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So now, if we go back and Dan and I walked into a scene for a patient who's bleeding and we look at a blood pressure 102 over 88, the difference between those numbers, it's very small. And we would both recognize this as a narrow pulse pressure which is telling us the cardiac output's going down because this patient is losing blood, and he's trying to compensate for that drop in his pressure by constricting vessels. And you know what's interesting is the more blood he loses, the lower the stroke volume, the lower the cardiac output, the lower the systolic blood pressure, and as he loses more blood and the cardiac output goes down, along with the systolic blood pressure, what does he do? Constricts more vessels. The diastolic goes up. Those numbers continue to get closer and closer and closer. And that's the pulse pressure. I tell students, instead of really looking at the blood pressure, you have to look at it. Always look at the pulse pressure. And again, we're not going to ask anybody to calculate the numbers, but what we want to say is if you have to say to yourself, boy, those numbers look awfully close together, you probably could assume that it's a narrow pulse pressure. And if trends uh, change those over time to get smaller together, if you have a long transport time, you're taking multiple sets of vitals, it's an important trend to watch. 